The solemnity of Corpus Christi is for me a liturgical anniversary. While the date of my first Mass as a priest was June 3rd, three years ago, the liturgical day was Corpus Christi. This came to mind yesterday as I attended this year's ordinations of two new priests. And there's one prayer in that rite of ordination that sticks out to me this weekend in a particular way. After the ordinandi make a series of promises to preach, to teach, to celebrate the Eucharist, to pray, etc., the bishop says, may God who has begun the good work in you bring it to fulfillment. May God who has begun the good work in you bring it to fulfillment. I think this idea of fulfillment is an important one as we approach the Eucharist on this solemnity of Corpus Christi. Because as God works to bring his good work in each of us to fulfillment in our eternal salvation, he was at work throughout salvation history to bring his good work in a special way to the fulfillment of the Eucharist. Now we should know that God prefigured the Eucharist in the Old Testament. But the examples that might easily come to mind are probably the unleavened bread in the flight from Egypt, or the manna miraculously given in the desert, or the bread brought to Elijah in the wilderness to keep him alive. But our Old Testament reading today is none of these. Instead, we are presented with a very vivid image of worship in the days of Moses. He had young bulls sacrificed, divided the blood, splashed half of it over the altar, and after the people pledged themselves to following God, he sprinkled the people with the other half. What are the good works begun here that are brought to fulfillment in the Eucharist? I think there are three that we should discuss today. First, this was a continuation of an idea that began in Egypt with the sacrifice of the Passover lambs something still, that was still being commemorated in our gospel today. In Egypt, many animals were closely linked with their deities. They even believed that sometimes a deity would come among them as an animal. One of those animals was the ram, exactly what God asked his people to kill and spread its blood on their doorposts as a clear symbol of their rejection of the pagan Egyptian idolatry. This sacrifice in the desert furthered the idea that while God had gotten all of the Israelites out of Egypt, he hadn't yet gotten all the Egypt out of the Israelites. How is this fulfilled in the Eucharist? It's fulfilled because it is still a way to ensure that we place God first in our lives before the concerns of the world. We give a day of our week without work. We fast from food an hour before we come here. And outside of the pandemic, we are required to come to Mass, setting aside whatever of the world wants to take our time, whatever the world would weigh as more important than this. In many ways, our devotion to the Eucharist, like the sacrifice of a lamb or other animals of old, is meant to proclaim our priorities to the world. Second is how these offerings of blood could symbolize blood relations with God. The Israelites could not bridge the gap between God and man, but this offering of blood could symbolize their efforts. As they lifted these bowls, or cups, as our psalm says, they called on the name of the Lord to complete what they could not and to unite them to him as family. Today, it is the Eucharist, the body of Christ, that makes all those who partake of it part of the body of Christ, the church, united to God as family in a way that the Israelites of old could only imagine. And finally, as our author of Hebrews hints at in our second reading, the earthly temple of the Israelites that was so central to their worship was merely a model of the heavenly temple. At the end of the chapter after our first reading from Exodus, as Moses received instructions for all the instruments of worship, how to construct the tabernacle, tent, altar, vestments, and more, God tells him, see that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. That is, Sinai. 
So on Mount Sinai, Moses was given a glimpse of the heavenly temple and told to replicate it as best he could on earth. Now in Christ, as our second reading seeks to make clear, there is no need for an earthly replica. We have access to the heavenly reality. We are reminded of this in the first Eucharistic prayer when the, where the priest says, in humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angels to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty. We gather in countless churches around the world, but we all bring our offering to the same heavenly temple. God is all about bringing his good work to fulfillment. And the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith, is the greatest tool for doing just that. Whether it is in cementing God as first in our lives, uniting us to him as family, or giving us that glimpse into the heavenly temple where we hope to worship for eternity, the Eucharist should be our source of strength so that the bishop's prayer in each ordination may come true in each of our lives. May God, who has begun the good work in us, bring it to fulfillment. <laughs>